<clears throat> Alyssa, welcome to the show. How's it going? Hi, how are you? Doing great, doing great. How are things by you? I'm going, I'm keeping on, keeping on. As you, as Jordan, unfortunately saw dealing with scheduling me, my life is absolute chaos right now, but I'm excited to have this chat. Finally, I kind of promised Jordan a few months ago, so I'm holding to it. Yeah, I appreciate that. I've, I've persevered through and uh, <laughs> shot my shot a couple of times and got you on. Yes. Very, very excited for that. Cool. So for people who live under a rock and who don't follow you, let's give us, uh, actually, before we even do that, I like to give a little brief of like why I have you on as people know me. And so of all the people that I yeah. could have on the podcast, like I want to say why I wanted you on. And then I want you to tell me a little bit about you. And so I feel like there are, there are some people really exemplify what this podcast is about. This like optimal versus practical, just like finding that marriage between those two things. But in order to actually be able to find the marriage between those two things, you need to have a really deep understanding of the science and also work with real people. Uh, and so I think you do this amazingly well. I think your page comes across as like such a good intersection of science, but also like there's just a tone that I can tell who works with real people and who is a little disconnected from like the average person. I think you do that really well. A lot of good humor thrown in there too. So if you don't follow Alyssa, definitely go do that. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about you, what you're up to, your, a little bit of your backstory. I know some things, but not too in depth. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. And thank you. I do try. Sometimes I feel like I almost focus so much on translating science to the gen pop because that's who I, it matters that it gets to that sometimes people forget that I'm a scientist um, because I focus so much on that communication. And I truly believe, especially coming from my field, there's so many people who are so smart that just have no ability to get that to people and that like if we could bridge that gap between science and practical application is what I would like to call it our two industries could probably do a lot more good in making impact with what the science is doing behind a, a paywall versus like the coaches who are working with the people but don't actually know any of the stuff that we know so I'm really really passionate about that so I appreciate that sentiment um so for those of you who are unfamiliar with me and my work I'm kind of a jack of all trades and master of many, but I don't know. I don't want to say none. Um, uh, cause I just have my hand in a lot of pots, but I'm very multi-passionate about a lot of things, but essentially, um, right now I am in my final semester of my PhD. Um, I'm getting my PhD in exercise physiology. I have a master's degree in exercise physiology and then a bachelor's degree in health sciences, pre-professional health sciences. And so I've really spent the last 11 years studying exercise science, human physiology, science, sports, nutrition, um, metabolism and all of these things. And so I've always loved this stuff from an early age. Um, I was an athlete like my whole life. And I just really, truly like had this moment when I was probably in eighth grade, when I first started running and falling in love with running, where I was like, you know what, this is amazing. This is incredible. Everyone needs to know about this. I want to spend the rest of my life learning as much as I can so I can help everyone else find this too. And then I grew up and realized behavior change and exercise engagement and science is a lot messier than just like, oh my God, everyone, you have to do this too. You got to see this, my purity of 14. But I really kind of held true to that testament of myself. I mean, I was like the person who was running sprints in the snow after school. No one made me do it. I just loved exercise and physical activity. And I just carried that passion into college. And I played college sports for a few years, but I quickly realized that science and my career and academics was more so what was going to be my future. And so I left college sports after two years um, and finished up my degree in a year and a half and then moved on and went to grad school. And I started doing research early on in undergrad. And I just really loved that process. I don't know. Like, I didn't know that that was a thing. No one had showed me that was a thing and that there was actual science and research and like questioning and learning all of these things within our field. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. So for those that are unfamiliar with me and my work, essentially, I've been a, doing research the last few years, but the large majority of my work is in metabolism and energy systems and like kind of exercise physiology and human metabolism and postprandial metabolism and the intersection of like kind of where exercise and nutrition overlap and how that affects our health with the, like a little bit of an emphasis and specialty in like women's physiology and that kind of stuff. So, um, but along with that though, the last few years I've engaged in powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, kind of recreational CrossFit and ultra marathon running. So I've kind of become known as the, the hybrid girl because I was just always an athlete and that always made sense to me. But then when you get into the fitness industry, it's you have to, you, you're a bodybuilder or a powerlifter. That's all you get to do. That's the only options that you get when you sign up to, to do fitness based off the fitness industry. That's all you get to do. That's it. Maybe nowadays, like there's a little bit more like CrossFit, right? But you get like, it's like, pick your player. 
And it's like there, there's like three coaches standing there with the 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 Mario theme song yeah, or, or Smash whatever. Smash Bros or whatever. Smash Bros yeah. theme song. And it's like you only get to powerlift, you get to body build slash fitzbow build, which are like the same thing. And like maybe you do some CrossFit or something like that, or you're a roadrunner. Like those are the four options that you get in the fitness industry, but the running industry and the fitness industry are somehow two entirely different things that do not overlap at all, which makes no sense to me. And so when I started my business in 2018, the same semester I started my PhD, I started doing one, I started with one-on-one coaching and I was training for my first ultra marathon. I had been trail running for a few years, but I grew up running. Like I did cross country growing up. I played a field sport. So like running always made sense to me. I only took a hiatus when I was powerlifting. And that's when I was like, oh, wow, this sucks. I'm so out of shape and miserable. And I feel like garbage what's going on. Um, because I drank the juice that you couldn't be cardiovascular trained and strong at the same time. Like I was a master's student. I mean, I technically, I like just started my master's, but I was drinking the Kool-Aid. I was like, no, I can't do this. I must be a potato. And so I just, you know, kind of got into outdoors stuff, trail running, ultra running. And then my clients were coming to me and it was, it's funny because I I remember thinking that no one would take me serious as a strength coach because strength is more formally like my background, like strength training and stuff like that. And I had just started getting into the running stuff. And I was like, no, one's going to buy a lifting program from someone who's running. And it was felt like a really risky thing to start my business while start started training for an ultra marathon. Cause I started with strength programs, like gym programs, like you know, that's what I started offering. And then what I realized like right away in my business, and if you run a business, like take these nuggets and pivot, that's my shameless business advice to you. All of my one-on-one clients were either lifestyle and they really just needed something to like help them find structure. But then all of the ones who wanted something more specific were like, Hey, I want to run, but I also want to lift. And literally nobody is telling me how to do this. I don't, I didn't even think that I had fallen onto this niche of like brilliance. And now I think it's funny on no shame to this. You can find a lot of little coaches pages now who put hybrid coach, hybrid athlete, hybrid trainer. And I'm like, I, I feel like me, maybe like Alex Viata and like, or like the people who like were the first ones to do that. But from like, I feel like I was like a really onset first female doing this in the industry. And it's cute now. I'm like, oh, I started a thing. How adorable. It's slim um, pickings. It's slim pickings. This is a topic that we're going to talk about concurrent training, running and lifting programs. And it's, it's slim pickings. If, if I'm thinking of somebody I want on there, it's, I mean, you're, you're at the top of that list for me. And there's it, and not, it's funny that I have yeah. a ton of options. No. And like a lot of good strength and conditioning coaches and specialists, like they, what I'm doing isn't radical, but to the consumer, it's radical because no one's patch, packaging it up for them. So I train with a strength and conditioning coach and like, he's one of my good friends and he has a former undergrad in our lab. And like, we joke all the time because he ends up training all these ultra marathoners through the gym for some reason. And he just keeps finding this. And I like, he, he doesn't, well, there's no formal training on this. It's just strength and conditioning, right. Applied to specific goals. And like, I just think that like the fitness industry gets so far away from what like formal strength and conditioning is with athletes. What would you do with them? You would have seasons of training. You would have different goals and you would have like, like alternations. Like that's all concurrent training. If you're working with athletic populations, that's concurrent training. And I feel like the fitness industry just completely remove themselves from that. So yeah, I completely agree. Like there's not a lot out there. And so, yeah, really quick. I was like, oh, people really want this. Like I'm a lifter girl, but people like, I'm the only one that's like, I was like bringing running programs to the fitness industry in 2018. And it was like, they had never seen running before in their life. Cause no one was, cause the fitness industry and the running industry are just like not overlapped enough that people knew that it existed. So my first ebook was a running ebook, even though like I was a 400 pound deadlifting power lifter, like it made no sense, but like that was the gap of what people wanted and needed and just wasn't in the industry. So anyway, long story short. I am really strong. I've ran like 10 ultra marathons and here I am on Jordan's podcast. I'm going to finish my PhD. So yeah. I am also kind of crazy. So you're, so what you're saying is you're, you're pretty new to this whole fitness thing. Got it. So you just got your foot in the door. I like just noted. started. If you had to yeah, sum that yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I certainly want to talk about this metabolism postprandial women's biz stuff. Like another time that's something that's, I, I wrote that down. I was like, I need I to know. book this out for another year and a half out from here, but yeah. I definitely want to talk about that. Yes. Um, After I'm, April, I'm, my life should be yeah. a little bit less chaotic. All right. Oh, cool. Well, the <laughs> listeners will hold you to that. Um, I'm thinking about this like academic route versus just like, I know that you, you have, I want to hear a little bit more about the business side of things and what you offer at some point, but what was it always an, an understanding that you wanted to take an academic role? I think 
I, I personally don't even remember at the time thinking about what I wanted to do. And so having like an actual moment of like reflection and thinking, oh, this is the route I want to go. just isn't something that I had done at the time. And so I'm curious if that was something you did. You're like, okay, this is the path I want to be on. And yeah. then to, to piggyback this question, I'm curious what the end goal is for you. If there is an end goal, if you just want to continue doing research or you want to, obviously you're doing a bunch of things, but is there an end goal from yeah. an academia side? So for me, like I originally almost went to school for business and marketing, which I think is fitting because my business does really well because my strengths are probably in business and marketing. Like I actually probably would have been really good in that. I'm probably, the, I really just don't think that I'm made for science. And I don't say that as a, like a, as a downside to me, because the things that I'm good at are not celebrated in academia. I'm really good at communication and presentation and like broad scale, like theories and sweeping and ideas that I'm creative, but that nitty gritty science stuff, you know, that's not what I would say that my brain is intuitively like trained to do, but I'm a really good student. And so like, I kind of worked with myself and learning that because essentially what happened is I, I was supposed to go to one school, the lacrosse coach got fired. My scholarship was like a mess. And so I couldn't afford to go there anymore. So I switched call. So like, I'm pretty much here today, probably by sheer accident of something that was the worst thing that could have happened to you at 18 years old. It happened on my 18th birthday. Like this is like true to the day. Um, so I was mortified or super upset. And I was like, Oh my God, my life. Cause sports were my life. That's all I knew. I just, I, I loved, I, I, I was an athlete. That's all I was. I was an athlete. I didn't even care about anything else, but school. I mean, I was like an honor student in high school. I wasn't like blowing my grades off, but I wasn't really trying. Um, and so I got to, um, college and I had decided to walk on a D2 team at like the state school in Pennsylvania and they had pre-professional health science and that was like the best thing they offered at their school and I the other school before I left it I wanted to go to exercise science but I couldn't afford the student fees like it was too expensive and my parents were like you should really reconsider this at the time um because I at the time I had this idea of like when I was like a freshman in college, because I remember then I walked in the school, I was in pre-professional health science. I remember my mom being like, well, what do you want to major in your track? It's pre-PA, pre-PT or like this open ambiguous track. And I was like, oh, I'll just do pre-professional, figure it out later. Like I thought I was going to be a PT or a PA. I just thought that that I had no idea what I was doing. I just was like, hey, cool. I really like this stuff. So it's a good thing. I'm going to go do it. Uh, and so I remember sitting in like my freshman seminar class and they're like, what do you want to do? And I had like followed Maria Purvis, who was a Nike elite trainer. And she had a degree in exercise science, but it was listed as exercise physiologist on her Nike trainer app thing. And I was like, that's what I want to do. That sounds cool. I, that's what I want to do. I want to be an exercise physiologist. I want to be like an elite Nike trainer. Like I just wanted to help people and learn a lot and know things and help people. Like I truly like care. I just was obsessed with fitness and athletics and sport. Like that just, that was my whole world. And I was told to change my major and I freaked out and I panicked. I was told to go to this. They had like kind of like a personal training strength coach degree. That was like a non-science version of exercise science is how I would describe it at my school. It was like recreational sports and fitness type thing. Um, and I was just like, not that I was too good for it, but I'm, I'm a smart girl. And so like, I went to my advisor's office and I freaked out and he's like, and I was like, I feel like I should be in the position where I can learn as much as I can. And I should do the harder route and I should do the more rigorous route. And I should like if I like, you know what I mean? Like that's always been my view is like, if you can do more and do it better, you should do it. And so I was 18 and that was my view. I didn't know what the hell I was doing with my life. I've just been wired this way, I guess my whole life. So I stayed in science. And what I learned quickly is I sucked at lacrosse, but I was really good at school, which was the opposite of my high school experience where I was like, and I just like, didn't identify as someone who's smart and good at science in high school. And I remember crying and like, I'm going to fail biology and I'm not smart enough. And then I got like a all A's and an A minus my first semester of college. And I was tutoring half the lacrosse team and like acing the bio exams and the A&P exams. And like, there was this moment at the end of the first semester. And if you've gone through a degree like this, where you take biology and physiology, like you get to energy systems. And I think this is so cliche foreshadowing of my whole entire life. And I remember sitting in the library, like in the 24 hour section, eating pizza, teaching everyone about like the energy system pathways. Like I was on the dry erase board, teaching all of my friends, they didn't fail the bio final. And I just loved it. Like I was just so good at teaching and I love the science and it excited me so much. And it's funny now, cause like my entire PhD work is fundamentally energy systems is essentially what it is. And so I kept working really hard at school. And then 
I didn't know about grad school. I didn't know about any of this. I just thought at some point, so I was like, maybe I'll be a nurse. Maybe I'll be a PT. Maybe I'll be a PA. But then I was like, no, you can be an exercise scientist, like exercise physiologist. And so I took exercise physiology, like first thing I could, like, I think it was like my third semester of college. I took it. You were able to take it once you finished AMP. And I loved it. And I just took every elective and every credit that you possibly could that was nutrition or exercise science related. So I basically made my own degree in exercise science and my I was able to graduate technically a year early and I emailed my advisor when I left the lacrosse team in a sophomore year. And I was like, Hey, listen, I'm ahead in credits. I, I like, I don't know what to do. Like, should I graduate early? What should I do? Blah, blah. And he said, what, why don't you graduate a semester early instead of rushing it, but come in the lab this fall and we'll do research. And a new assistant professor had joined who was also an exercise scientist. Um, and I essentially just started doing research in the lab. I started helping them with these research projects. I did little tiny poster presentations. I went to conferences and I found out that you can get grad school paid for. And I didn't have money. My, I was paying for my college and PT and PA school and med school, whatever you do, you have to pay for. But I loved research. It was so exciting. It was so cool for me to be in the lab. I don't know. I just, I, I, I loved it. It was just my perfect nerdy paradise. And I was just a really good student and going after it. And I was like, okay, like this is a thing. Like I can do this and I can get my school paid for. So I essentially spent that last year and a half being like, I'm going to do everything I can to ensure that the rest of my degrees can be paid for. What I essentially did was go above and beyond what was necessary to get in a master's program for exercise physiology, which to be honest, is not that hard to do. Um, but then I joined my master's and the plan was a PhD that entire time. I did research the whole time. I was super in the science. And so now like I, I've, I've gone back and forth a lot the last few years, just because academia is not the best sometimes, but I think every industry is not the best sometimes. And I do have my business, but to be honest, I don't know if I can handle social media for another decade of my life. And so these are things that have really weighed on me, um, the last year or so. So right now I, um, I'm most likely doing a postdoc. I'm waiting for the final contract to go through. So I still do want to do a few more years of research. I just feel like my time with research isn't done yet. But then after that, like I'm going to use my postdoc to figure out like, okay, do I really want to stay in academia? Do I want to pivot to a research industry position? Do I want to go all in on this business thing? Um, but I have a really hard time leaving the research thing fully. Um, I spent five years working really hard to be trained at doing research to, and just, just to leave to make infographs on Instagram just doesn't feel like my life's purpose and calling. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. But like, I just feel like I have all these skills that I'm not done. I want to still refine and learn. And um, I, the goal was to be a professor the whole time, but now it's like, I could still teach with what I do in the internet. So it's like really figuring out where I fall with that research science love that you kind of only get if you're in industry or, or research itself. So I'm going to hopefully do a postdoc, um, and get a former, few more years of formal training on that. And so hopefully you guys will still see more science from me. Um, I feel like a lot of people shit on science because they think that, well, no one has access to it or understands it. So you're not actually doing good work. So you should just work in the industry where you can impact more people. But then there's also the view of like, you can do good science that can actually move the field forward and add value. That is what is the people who are coaching and training are going to use to like do those things. So I feel like there's a lot of these like moral conversations between academia and the industry and like what's better, what's worse. And I just think that like, you can do good wherever you're at. Um, it's just about making sure that it like, you know, if you, if you love what you do and it aligns with what you are, you're probably going to impact more people doing that anyway. So that's my long synopsis, I guess, of that. I could have probably answered that a lot more briefly. I'm very sorry. That's cool. You're not on a, on a time constraint here. I think a recognition that there's a lot of different uh, levels of players in this like dissemination of information all the way from the person who's designing the research, doing the research, then the person who's reading the research, then the person who's reading the research review, then the person who's taking the research review and breaking it down into infographics. And then the person who's, you know, stealing those infographics, making their own infographics. And so I think yes. if you're like in the industry and you're thinking about, I have questions all the time about like, okay, I want to be in quote fitness space, you know, where can I be? I think there's a lot of areas that you can go. And I think the one that is not talked about a lot is the one that you're currently in, but you kind of, you kind of blur the line across a lot of these different ones. But I think yeah. it is a cool, Alan Aragon, Aragon and I talked a little bit about this, like just different like there's different players and then each of them play a different role. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing wrong with being the coach who reads the research review and then breaks it down into two pieces for clients. There's nothing wrong with being the person who writes the research review, the person who does the research, the person who designs the research. And so there's a lot of different yeah. places you can find, um, the, the, whatever matches up with what you like doing. And, and you, you mentioned kind of this idea of having skills and wanting to make sure that you were using them. You know, you worked hard to gain skills 
And there was almost this like yearning, this itch to like want to fulfill them. And so I definitely resonate with that. Yeah. I've been like an on the floor PT for so long and then actually gone back and actually spent a lot of time on learning slash education and then realizing that I was like not putting any of that into practice. Um, and so for me, going from a PT to whatever I do now, I guess you would say, has been uh, has allowed me to kind of uh, capitalize on the things that I think I'm good at and also actually put all the time and effort that I spent learning to actual good use. And so I could see you being like, you know, I don't want to step away from this thing I'm really good at, spend a lot of time learning about, um, but you are finding where you want to be in this whole yeah. hierarchy here. And that's not me to say that like what people do in the industry, there's anything wrong with that because my own moral conflict is, is an ego thing that makes me want to stay in science. Cause I know I'm really good at the science communication thing. So that's to say, I think all of those roles are really important. It's just, you know, I think people forget about the fact that like what they're pulling from, there's people, a lot of people who aren't present in the online space doing a lot of work that does contribute to the fitness industry. And so, you know, ideally being on that, that line between is hopefully, you know, hopefully, you know, like the people that I would like to be like Bill Campbell, like I talked to him at a conference this year and I was like, that's the position I'd ideally probably want to be in in my career, a mid-sized university where I'm doing research that I care about and like still, you know, active in the industry and translating that. And like, he's just an all around good person. And so I have a lot of respect for, for Bill Campbell. And I talked to him and I told him, I was like, kind of, that's like what I want to do. That's like ideal. Like I would love to be in his position in a few years. Um, but if I'm not like, that's okay. So yeah, there's so many levels of people and players that are making these things move forward. And the more we can get them to work together, I think the better the industry gets to as a whole. Yeah. Agreed. So today we're going to mostly talk about concurrent training. And I thought it would be interesting. First, I'll ask you for a brief de definition of that, but I want to do like a little bit of a mock consultation. So, yeah. you know, it's not, I'm not sure you're, you're doing one-on-one -on -one consultations, but if there's somebody out there who wants to run and lift or figure out a way to integrate those two, I think it's important that we talk about at least the types of questions that need to be answered before we get into like these like super specifics of like, should I run after I lift or before I lift? And so um, maybe give us a little bit of a brief introduction to what concurrent training is. And then maybe in a chronological sense, let's say I've come to you and I said, hey, I have this goal. I want to be strong. I want to have muscle. But I also love, you know, whatever cardio uh, modality. I love running. I love doing some mm -hmm. training or whatever. What does that, what does the beginning of that conversation sound like? Yeah. So the irony is as much as I kind of hate how much people ask me questions all the time because I'm not being compensated for it. I actually wish I had more time for one-on-one -on -one consults because I really like them. I, I, I really like consulting. I think even most, maybe more than like one-on-one -on -one training, because it's like this puzzle piece of figuring out what someone's problem is and their sticking point and the information they do need and like what they need to do. I think consults are super fun. Um, so like, this is a fun, creative way to do this, but, um, so I call it hybrid training if you guys follow me, but I say that kind of more so because it's a, it's a word, it's a simple word that's easy and people can identify with, and it makes them feel important and special that they can identify with something. Cause that's important to people. And I don't want people to think that I'm like playing them and manipulating them. Cause it's not, I'm not, but like hybrid is an easier thing. Like I'm a hybrid trainer. I'm a hybrid. Athlete. Easier to understand I do hybrid what that training means. versus like concurrent training. Like yeah. it's, yeah, it's like saying type two diabetes versus insulin resistance. Like right. people like, yeah, if you say I have insulin resistance, people are like, what the fuck is that? So like, um, <laughs> so you're yeah. keto. Okay. No, I'm just you're kidding. keto. Yeah. yeah. So I like to say hybrid training, but all I mean by this, and like, if you buy my ebook hybrid or any of my training programs to talk about this, I clearly define this as concurrent training. That is what it's really well established as in the literature or traditionally referred to. And all that is, is a fancy way of saying it is combining two or more forms of fitness, exercise, physical training, whatever it is that you're doing um, in a single session, week, or training cycle. So it really can be as simple as like your day, your week, or your whole training cycle. And so I think though, this is where like people like get really hung up. They're like, I'm a hybrid athlete. And there's a difference between being, I'm an endurance runner who uses strength training to complement my endurance training. There's a difference between I'm a power lifter who's doing enough cardiovascular physical activity. So I do not die. Cause I know that's important. And I am trying to maximize both at once. And there's a spectrum. And I have a, I have an Instagram post that has this spectrum where I show it because your priorities within concurrent training are going to depend on what your goals and priorities are in your fitness, right? I don't care if you use the hybrid trainer phrase for any of those things, because technically you're doing concurrent training and all people who lift should be doing cardio and all people who run who should be doing lifting. It's about how much you want out of both of those at the same time is where like the fine details of this are coming out. So that's essentially the formal definition of like concurrent training. But like when it comes to like this being a hybrid thing or whatever it is, like 
there's a lot of factors that go into like what you're going to do and the questions that people ask. And as always, people are like, I need a straightforward answer. And I feel like with everything that I talk about in fitness, hybrid or concurrent training is the hardest thing to give people straightforward answer because it truly is like, I depends at like the most maximal level of I depend it, of it depends, right? Like there's some basic practices of nutrition and lifting or endurance that we can tell people that apply to like almost most sick cases, but people hate it with the hybrid training. Cause you're like, no, literally this is a case by case thing. And like, that isn't meant to say that there isn't a straightforward answer, but it, it looks so different on everyone, but that's what makes it awesome and beautiful because at the end of the day, like, while there is no right answer, technically it just really like, it's what you want to make of it. So what, what would be some of the initial questions that would at least lead us down this path of going from this ambiguous, it depends to finding out what it does depend on. Yeah. And I can so, give some mock answers and we could go down a certain route. Yeah. So I think that like the biggest thing that I tell people is like, people think, okay, I'm going to start lifting or I'm going to start running together and it needs to be perfect. Right. It has to be perfect. I need to know the perfect thing. And they do this with all things of the fitness, but I feel like that's what like holds people back. And like, the biggest thing is like, you just need to get the training in to see what's working first. But the amount of volume and frequency of each that you can handle really depends on a few things. And this is usually what I tell people. And this is like what I have in my ebook and stuff like that is it depends on your current fitness status. The less fit you are, the less you can handle of both or either. So it's going to be harder and you're going to have to start with both less of both, right? I think hybrid is my only ebook where I straight up tell people like in the nicest way possible, you're not fit enough to worry about what you're worried about yet. And that if that's, so if you're a new trainee or you're early on and you want to do mixed modality training, really everything's going to work for you because you, everything's a physiological response. It doesn't matter which order you do it in, or if you do it perfectly, like you're going to adapt either way. And that you kind of benefit from that too. If you've only been running or you've only been lifting and you add one of the other, well, then like, you don't really need to worry about anything too much right now because your body's just adapting to the bare minimum. So you, your, your current fitness status really affects how much volume you can handle. And like, that also includes like your hybrid, like fitness status. So you could be a really trained lifter with very little cardiovascular training. And you're going to have to start from the bottom up. And that might steal away from the total amount of volume you can handle. I call this my fishbowl analogy. You only have so much water in your fishbowl and the more fit you are, the more water you have to pull out of the fishbowl. I know it could be a bucket theory or whatever you want to call it, but like you only have so much water to give and the more fit you are and the more years and the more reps, and the more miles you have in the tank, the more you can handle at the same time. So everyone wants to do everything at the same time all the time. They want to go from, I'm lifting three days a week to I'm lifting three days a week and running three days a week and resting one day a week, or I'm running five days a week, but I'm going to start lifting three days a week and take no rest days. So they just start adding and pulling from what they don't have. So you have to work with your current fitness status and like, the more fit you are, the more training history you have in either or both, the more you're going to be able to handle, right? So you can do more days of each, the more fit that you are. And that just gets developed with time. And then you have to talk about like, this is where I think it's people get the most caught up in concurrent training is that they're like, well, I don't have time for that. And I'm like, well, time's a factor in how much you can do. Like that's a factor. And so, yeah, there's going to be these optimal ways for you can to train 15 hours a week and do everything, but Many of you can't do that. So you have to be honest and realistic of like what you can handle. So you might have to do less of either or both, depending on what your primary goal is in the moment in order to figure out like what you're trying to achieve. But like, you just might have to play the slower game if you're trying to do both, right? Because you are trying to improve two things at once. So like, you really have to ask yourself how many hours or a day do I have to train? And how many days per week can I actually train? What is the most realistic? What can I actually get in? So, and that is also limited by how fit you are, right? Because you can have 15 hours a week to train, but if you're completely sedentary and you want to start doing this, you're probably only going to be training three or four hours a week, right? Like you can't use all those 15 hours. Um, and then there's going to be like, what is your specific goal in this moment, in this season? So I love taking a season's approach to the hybrid training, which anyone who's formally trained in strength and conditioning knows that athletes have a postseason, a preseason, an in-season, an off-season, or like whatever it is. Like that is a standard practice. And that's what I try to bring like to hybrid training. Cause like, think about it when I was an athlete growing up, like I did sprints all summer to prepare me for fall ball. And then fall ball, you did like all of this heavy conditioning. And then in the winter you did, you, you know, you kind of in, peaked on that. But then once you get to the season, you're just maintaining, you're lifting like one day a week. You're not really even doing conditioning. Like you're just maintaining, then you recover. And then you kind of go back to the building. Right. 
I take that same approach. You have to ask yourself what your goal in is in the moment, because what your concurrent training looks like when you're training for a race versus just exercising for health versus in a strength training phase versus like whatever, or training for a strength meet is going to look different. And so this is the same thing with the fishbowl. The amount of water you're putting into one versus the other is going to shift and change. And so that is like, you have to ask like, what is your current goal in the moment? But then you also need to ask, what is your long-term goal? So this is where I think a lot of like beginner, maybe early on fitness trainees get really sweeped up in this is that like, they can't think past a 12 week goal yet. Where with, if you really like want to be hybrid in your hybrid training, you have to think in like years, like what can I achieve in years? Not just like six months, 12 months. And that's really, really hard. And I get that. Like, I, I completely understand that, but like, it's about, I have this thing called the, the hybrid training pyramid and the bottom is your aerobic base and your strength training base. And until you have built both of those, you really can't build on top of it is like theoretically, like my, like how I approach this is like, you have to have both, but over time you can increase each of those slowly, but surely. And then you can refine your energy systems and like your volume capacity and like how much you can recover and how much you can do at the same time. But then you're able to do more of both as you build. And so I have a graph in my hybrid ebook that basically has like these two lines over time. And basically like, there's this theory, I can't remember the author of this paper, but like essentially like if you're a beginner and immediate trainee, you can improve at both at the same time continuously until you pretty much get to an elite level. And then you have to pick one or the other, and you can still get better, but it's going to start to plateau if you keep doing both versus one or the other. But the point of hybrid training is never to be the best at one. It's to maximize your ability to do both at any given point in time. But that's why it takes so long. So you have to ask yourself, like, this is my short-term current goal. And if I'm trying to maximize this, what is my long-term goal that I'm trying to achieve? And like, when do I need to back off of one versus adding the other? So like the biggest things to sum this all up is, what is your current fitness status and training history? You got to get real and honest with yourself, especially if you want to have more of an athletic goal that is more hybrid training. This is not meant to say like, I'm shaming people who have general fitness and health. You can do mixed training for general fitness and health. If anything, I encourage it. Hybrid training is just the physical activity guidelines in disguise. Um, so what is your current fitness status? How many days per week can you actually handle training? How much volume can you actually handle of lifting and running on their own, but together? And then like, how does doing them together diminish that? Um, what, how much time you have to give each week? What can you realistically do to train and being okay with knowing that like some seasons you might just have to train more, but then like you'll have a recovery season if necessary. Um, and planning that with your life. So it works with you. Um, and then three, what is your short term current goal? What are you working towards? And then what is your long term goal? Like that this current training that you're doing contributes to positively and how you're moving that forward. And theoretically, over time, you're just building one area and maintaining the other and building one area and maintaining the other. It's not really pushing both unless you are in that beginner stage where like, everything's making you get better. So hopefully that was concise enough to like be straightforward, but those are like the big takeaways that I really want people to understand is like, you know, it's fun to say, I'm going to go do all these things, but then you just start slapping volume on top of what you already can't recover from and what you already can't even handle in your week of training. And then you're like, this doesn't work. And you're like, no, you, you can't, you got to be patient with your body in the process with this. And you can't fake fitness. Awesome. That's a ton there. And there's definitely things we're going to pick apart. I think the first, I think a lot of what you said, if I'm summarizing, summarizing my own words just for my own purposes, <laughs> secretly pretending like I'm doing this constructively for the podcast, um, it's like, there's a finite amount of time and a finite amount of like physiological recoverability. And so like, there's, you're going to be limited by one of those two. And I think very practically speaking, people are going to have to really decide on pushing one of the two adaptations a little bit more than the other via just not having enough time to do both. I think recoverability, if it was your sole goal in life, at least nov relative novices could adapt to both. And first of all, if you're new to either of these adaptations or both, if you're new to more endurance style training versus more, more metabolic slash conditioning slash whatever you want to call it, uh, and you're also new to some form of strength training, like you're going to get all the adaptations. Everything is so novel uh, and you can do both. And what's cool is like a lot of times you know, this is the time where you actually can push both adaptations and you get to lean into the fact that you actually don't need as much of either of them and you get like the best of both of them. And so it is a yeah. fun time. And if you are somebody who's been a, you know, habitual lifter, it's looking to get into 
running let's use running as like this catch-all term for the whatever endurance pursuit that you have um and you're gonna you don't need to add a lot to see really great adaptations and again that the trainability or the threshold that you need to, uh, in terms of stimulus to push that adaptation is going to go up over time but in the beginning if you've been a habitual lifter and you want to get better at running like you don't need a lot and same with vice versa if you've always been running and you're like hey i'd like to you know get stronger or build muscle for whatever purpose like you don't need a lot um and then i think as you be go, go from this newbie phase to you have a bit more of these adaptations, you become more trained in whichever of these pursuits we're talking about, maybe the need to periodize becomes a little bit greater, you're going to need to kind of choose at least in the current moment in the current season in the current block or whatever we call it, where mm -hmm. you're not really going to be able to pursue both of these adaptations simultaneously, or maybe you would say that if you could, then you'd be making a huge trade off in, in the actual speed at which you'd be get, getting those adaptations, like maybe you know, wh where is the cutoff point where I'm so trained that I really need to focus on one and maintain the other? It's a little bit vague, but it's certainly going to get to a point where trying to do both is it's almost like, you know, a similar analogy is like recomping at maintenance for somebody who's got a lot of muscle. It's like, well, you can yeah. burn a little fat and build a little muscle, but it's not really practical to push push either of those adaptations without like yeah. the deficit or the surplus. That's a, that's a great parallel that I think a lot of people can relate to. And like, I just think that it's really hard because like, you don't want to discourage trainees, but you like, there are just so many people aren't fit enough to worry about it. That like, I think it gives you permission to know that like you have so much potential more. And like the point of what you have to decide, this is going to be more so limited by your time and priorities than your actual physiological ability to do both. Like truly like that point of which that occurs is going to be your, I feel like people's time is what limits this more than their actual, like capacity like yeah. it, you know what I mean especially when we're talking like normal everyday people not people who like you know work out for their job or like that's such a priority to them that they're spending all of this time doing this do you do you find that do you find that there's actually and I, and I will start with my bias of the, of that I don't that I I have feel one way versus the other way and I won't say which but I, do you find that there are a lot of people who truly care about pushing both adaptations or do you find that there's a greater population of people who are really concerned with one but want to also get at least a minimum effective dose of the other or do you find that there are people coming to you and i'm sure that they both exist out there but like do you find that there's if you had to pick maybe a majority or give your kind of uh, anecdote of this experience like are there people who want to push yeah. both the adaptations or do you find that there's a lot of people who are like i want to lift and be strong and, and do hypertrophy and do strength but i also like running and then kind of the vice versa as well i think that for the most part most people aren't trying to do what I do. My friend, Jason, that I ran my hundred K with is a freak of nature. And he's doing this right now, training for a tr half, like a half Ironman and doing this. And there's those, there's a few other people that are doing this, but most people aren't trying to do what I do. And I don't say this to be like, you'll never be like me, but most of you don't want to be doing what I'm doing. And that's okay. But I think for the most part, it's like those beginner to intermediate trainees who want to be able to do both because they enjoy both, but felt like they weren't allowed to, because they had some personal trainer who said, oh, you can't run. It's going to kill your gains, but they genuinely enjoy running their half marathons. They want to run a trail race. Maybe they want to run a 50 K and like, but they still want to be able to deadlift like 200 pounds or a little bit more. And like, that's so realistic. Like my female athletes that my, or my clients that are doing this, that are running half marathon, marathon, 50 Ks, they're routinely deadlifting in the two hundreds. And that's so much fun for them because that's awesome, right? That's significant. That's like really good. And that's not a strength ceiling where it's going to hurt them in either. Right. Like that's not like issue. So I feel like it's most people who are like, either you have the group of people who are really obsessed with running and they're terrified of adding and lifting and they need to be doing it in a way that's structural that allows them to support those goals. Or you have like the big meathead bros who are like, oh my God, I've been told for years I can't add cardio or I'm going to lose all my gains. Um, but a lot is that intermediate gen pop population who just, they want to enjoy their fitness and they want to feel athletic and they want to train for things in a way that make them feel good and excites them, especially I think with women, my niche, because like the fitness industry only gives them body focused fitness and not objective focused fitness. And like, it's so fun for them to do like PR a deadlift a month after they finished a, tr a running cycle. You know what I mean? Like, or to see that they can stay strong and don't have to sacrifice that while running their first 10 K or their half marathon, or like training for a trail ultra and not having, and realizing that like they can be strong throughout that. And it, and it helps them. So I would say like the majority of what people are coming to me for are that, or like they fall into those three categories, right? They're either one end of the extreme or the other, and they were afraid to do the one or the other because they thought it was going to hurt the other one. 
or it's just like that intermediate gen pop who wants to do both. And there's probably, I mean, I've had a handful of people who genuinely come to me because they want to do more so closer to what I'm doing. Very athletic uh, people, um, or they want to have a high end of strength to support like maybe even pretty good, like ma- outdoor sports performance, things like that, cycling, whatever it is. I mean, I do have that, but they're not trying to maximize strength, but they're essentially just getting stronger with time without it, like, n- like not at the fault of their own endurance performance, but they just like never were pushing that before. So that's what I would say. Like the biggest thing is, so I call it hybrid, but it's a catch-all. So yeah, you're right. I mean, most people aren't trying to do what I'm doing. They're not plotting three years in advance of what they want to do. Like I have a few people who do that and friends and, you know, there are people out there that are doing that, but that's like such nitty gritty, like I could tell you intentionally why I've done everything I've done in the last two years and my plan for the next year. You know what I mean? In my fitness. Like I could tell you that, but you don't have to go that far out. I would say most people are just, they, and also because they feel like people, they want to do something more fun and try something different with their fitness. And they've only been training one way for a few years. So that's a way for them to like, you almost always have variability in your training by default of training like this. So yeah, no, you're completely right. Most people are not trying to maximize both and they're thinking like they, they need to train, like they're trying to maximize both. Yeah. And as much as it is fascinating to take all three of those buckets and break down the nutrition protocols and periodization structure and uh, to map out the several years, I find that to be absolutely fascinating for part of the final exam on the nutrition certification that I did, whatever you had to do like a year out plan for an ultra. I, of course, I'm like, spend my whole life learning about hypertrophy and strength. And the, 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 the mock like uh, situation that I get for the final exam is like, build this in ultra endurance runner nutrition plan and training program and like carb plan and all this go through the whole thing. And I'm like, Oh, that's great. This is, I would have loved the guy in, who wants to build muscle. This would have been really great. But all of that to say, I yeah. feel like in the last little bit of time, like we have like 20 minutes or so I'd really like to and I don't, I'm not putting this scenario up on a pedestal by any means, but I had to no. guess which is the, which scenario is the person listening to this most likely in. It's probably the person, and I do not want to generalize. I know that there's listeners across the board here, but I would say if we could go through a little bit of specifics on the kind of person who wants to lift for some combination of strength and hypertrophy for some combination of functional and aesthetic benefit but also Mm -hmm. likes running from a fun and fun perspective, Mm -hmm. but also does want to get better at it. Maybe we could use something like, I want to run a 10 K and I want to do it like with confidence. Like how are we going about that person's potentially nutrition and periodization? Yeah. I think that like probably is the catch all for a lot of what I'm doing with my clients. And I, I don't want to be like, I don't feel like I, you know, feel like I have to defend myself because people are probably listening to this thinking like, Oh, she's just some lanky ultra runner. Like I'm, I'm a big meaty hunk of muscle who's stronger than 99% of women. So like I get these goals and priorities. So I'm saying this with like, yes, I probably have a genetic bias that allows me to do this, but like, I'm telling you that like the amount of cardio that you need to interfere with your strength and hypertrophy is probably so much more significant than what you think it is. And like, the biggest thing is like, I, I don't know if I love the phrase, like you can only train from what you can like eat back kind of, cause like to some point you can, you can eat all this food in the world and your training sure. is still too much. Um, but the biggest thing with this is like, you're going to just have to eat more. Like, I think a lot of people like to some degree, yes. Like cardio gets demonized in, in like weight loss because your body adapts to it with running. And like, you have to be like, that's the point you want your body to be more efficient. You want it to be less stressful on your body because as you adapt, you'll be able to do more and have it be less stressful on your body, but you'll have to increase carbohydrate because you're going to be expending like endurance activity expends more carbohydrates and depletes your glycogen stores more readily than you're lifting well. And so you, if you really don't want your gains to be impacted, you're going to have to eat more carbs and more carbs are protein sparing. So it's going to not, it's going to help reduce the catabolism that you're so worried about having and the interference and stuff like that. Like it, like it really ta- comes down to like one, the volume of what you're starting with can be slow and you can adapt with it. Right. Um, and as long as you can still recover from it, like then you're probably okay. And I think like anecdotally, like my experience is I don't notice any detriments in my effects of my lifting or my performance until I get to like 30, 35, 40 mile weeks, which is like more than most people are running on um, your problem. Unless you're like have a big running goal, or maybe you're running for a, a, like a higher mileage half marathon program or a marathon, you're probably running between 10 to 20 miles a week that's probably what you're running. And if you're dosing that out on your days that you're not lifting, 
and or after your lifts and also eating back a lot of that, it's probably not going to interfere it as long as you're increasing your intensity and volume slowly. So the biggest thing is that when it comes to endurance modalities, like running is probably going to be the one that's going to provide the most neuromuscular uh, fatigue that's going to carry over into your lifting. And so like cycling will be maybe less or like your like rower conditioning, things like that. So like, if we're assuming running, then like, we'll stick with that. Cause that's my niche and my population is that one increase it slowly while you're increasing it. You might need to pull back a little bit on your lifting volume. If you feel like you're not recovering, but if you have a pretty good athletic base and you're pretty fit, it shouldn't affect you too, too much, especially if you're doing it slowly. And the biggest thing that I think people like realize is that like the intensity of the running is what's going to more negatively impact you're lifting, especially if we're doing like this sub one hour running goal thing. And so I really am a big goal. Like I push zones a lot in low, slow zone running, but the fatigue and the recovery and the stress on your body of doing like a zone two run, especially if you're increasing mileages or building a base, that's not going to, you're, that's going to feel a lot easier to do after a lift or like if you do it and then you lift the next day, as long as you're adapted to those miles and you're not increasing your mileage too rapidly, you're probably not even going to notice because you're keeping that intensity down. So running slower is something that will help so much without that carryover affecting your lifts. Um, volume after some point, I mean, you can run slow and if you start running for two or three hours, yes, it's going to carry over. But if we're taking in this like 5k, 10k range, whatever, um, doing it slower. And then if you do speed work where you want to be fast and more confident doing it on like days where like you're doing it after a lift, maybe like after an upper body day, that's a really good time to do it or doing it like after your legs in the week, if you want to prioritize those, but spacing it out from another lower body session, because I feel like that's the two that people fight with the most. They're like, oh my God, it's killing my leg day gains. But the biggest thing that I would say for these people, if you're worried about like if running's affecting your lifting too much, look at the speed of your bar more than anything. Like that's how you're going to know if you're maybe doing too much or too fatigued or not recovering. If your lifts just start moving slower, right? Like that's a really great way of feedback of knowing that like, cause soreness isn't the best indicator, but if you're, if you're start lifting, like you're less powerful, that's when you're going to know, but it takes so much volume and you're probably going to only notice it if you're lifting above like 75, 80% of your max with your lifts. So like for the most part, like I would say like t- talking, like start with just like, I mean, say you're starting from nothing and you want to start running, you want to run a 10 K and you're a lifter and say, let's say, what do you think the average person lifts in this situation? Like four days a week, would you say four days, like a, four, week yeah, four days a week? I would say it's probably like conventional. If you started adding in like two to three days a week in small increments, like I do walk run to start with my programs and my clients and everything like that, like starting walk run or like steady state, whatever, after you're lifting, you're not going to notice a difference probably for a while. And then just start increasing that slowly as you increase your um, volume. The rule of thumb is 10% of week, but you can plateau. Like you don't have to increase 10% every week. Like you can go and like, you can like plateau and find a maintenance essentially level of cardio that you can handle before increasing more. If you're really, truly worried about this and like kind of just slowly increasing and maintaining and only increasing volume or intensity. So don't start increasing your mileage and then increasing speed work at the same time. Like I would say like, I don't want to be like beginners can't do speed work, but I would start with just increasing your volume of running that you can handle and miles that you can handle and then worry about speed work after you do that. Um, because essentially at that intensity, you could probably theoretically get away with like doing a little bit less because you're doing more intense and like whatever it is. Um, So slowly increasing that across time in like small increments, getting up to that, you know, once you get to being able to run three miles and then you can slowly, like, you can kind of keep doing that. Like people think that you have to keep indefinitely increasing. Well, I ran three miles. So next week I have to run four. Like you can run three miles every Saturday for a month until you feel comfortable and you feel like you're, it's not impairing your recovery and pouring into your lifts. Because if you are a more novice beginner trainee like that, you're going to be sore. You're going to be tired. You're going to be fatigued because it's novel. It's new. So like new stuff is going to fatigue you by nature, but you can just increase, maintain, increase, maintain, increase, maintain, which will decrease that impact it has because your body will adapt to the endurance training because it will become more efficient. And so you will become better at it. You'll be able to recover and handle from it. Like your body's going to respond to the stress that you give it. So like give it time. And so I would increase that slowly over time and thinking of it, like, you know, over I, my 10 K beginner program is 10 weeks long, but that's where the assumption you did my five K beginner program. So give yourself like four to six months for that goal at the least kind of thing. Um, 
you know, in, but you can take it slower or longer with that. But when you're doing that, you're going to increase your carbs, especially at the beginning. You might notice that like, as you gain adaptations, that carb amount can go down. Um, but like, or maybe not down, but won't have to kind of, it won't increase indefinitely, but at first it's going to be more stressful on your body. So increase your carbs, increase your calories a little bit. You won't make, you, you know, don't worry about, you know, it's going to kill all of your things. Like you're worried about preserving muscle. You have to feed your muscle. Muscle is expensive for your body to handle. So you want to have that making sure you're sleeping appropriately. Um, but something I think a lot of people who are physique focused, if you are more hypertrophy physique focused, or they start running and they say, well, running made me fat. Gaining weight is not the end of the world. I think like maybe, I don't think too many people on this podcast are super anti-diet to the point they're going to come to me for it with pitchforks. But when your glycogen stores are super depleted, you're going to be hungry. Like that's going to increase your hunger signals. And I find that people who aren't like being conscious of where their calories are coming from, they increase calories, but by default, their body's trying to essentially restock their glycogen stores. But if you're not only eating strict carb sources and you're just eating, you end up eating a lot of fat and carbs to bring that carb amount up. And then you're eating more calories. And that's where you kind of like gain the weight and feel heavy and slow down or whatever people report. And like, if you kind of nix that off the bat by just increasing your carb amount from like strict carb sources in relationship to the increase of volume of what you're doing with your activity, that will one stave off any of that unwanted quote unquote, my running made me fat narrative that people make. Um, you just started eating more because you were, your body was trying to tell you something and you fed it the thing that it didn't need. Like, you know, I think that's where the nuances between fat and carb intake, when it comes to endurance stuff, that's where like, yeah, ca all calories at the end of the day, if you have protein equal, it doesn't matter. Well, if you are doing endurance activities, you can't just increase your carbs or your calories with just a bunch of fat, because it's not going to fill your glycogen stores. Your runs are going to feel like crap, but then you're going to be overeating calories at the same point in time and feeling frustrated. So like, that's where maybe like specific nutrient stuff does matter more. Um, for people in this situation, intra workout carbohydrates aren't a big deal, but if you're doing a lift and then a run back to back, I would, especially if your workouts are going to be like an hour and a half, I would say intra workout carbohydrate, like 30 grams an hour is probably fine. Um, just to help, like you're just like having carbs available in your body is decreasing that stress like of your body and like decreasing that stress in your muscles. And that can help kind of stave off some of that muscle breakdown and like enough carbs can be protein sparing to some degree. So then your body's not pulling proteins for nutrient metabolism or whatever. So if you are doing like a 60 minute lift and then a 30 minute cardio event after I would, I would include some carbohydrates and doesn't need to be 60 grams an hour, like 30 grams an hour is probably fine. You can sip on some Gatorade or whatever it is during your workout. Um, but just increasing that gradually over time. And then once you get to a point of mileage that you're comfortable with each week, then introducing something like interval work, speed work, if you care about getting faster, but you don't really have to care about that. If you don't want to, you can run a 10 K and never do speed work in your life. But I think that's the biggest thing people don't realize is that slow, easy running reduces the fatigue so much more. Um, or like what I do right now is I don't have a high volume of running, but I'm doing only speed work and higher intensity stuff, but like, that's all I'm doing. So like I'm, I'm my volume is down, but my intensity is up kind of thing. Like you can have that trade-off. So it's not pulling from your workouts and your performances more so. And, you know, really just making sure that like, if you really care about your strength and hypertrophy, you're going to have to just make sure you're still supporting your body nutritionally to do what it's trying to do. And like, um, and then within that, when we're talking about structuring your weeks and stuff like that always do your lifting first. If that's your priority, you can do your cardio after, unless you are more advanced in your lifting. There was a meta-analysis that came out this past year that basically said that you could do it back to back and it doesn't affect your training with the 20 minute gap between it reduced like most of the interference effect kind of thing. Um, and so I would say, just do your training that you're, you care about first and then do your endurance training or separate them, like do a morning session and a PM session. And like, I think that like, even in the peak of my ultra marathon training, I'm never doing double days more than twice a week, unless your priority is like, you only can train four days a week. And you just want to do all your running on the same day. That's like the only other time that you would do that. But like, really, if you're lifting four days a week and you do cardio three days a week, you could still have two rest days and just do your shorter run days on the same days of your lifting. And you're never really working out for more than an hour and hour and a half, depending on how long your training sessions are like, that's just such a realistic training schedule. And I think it's so interesting how people overthink that or demonize that when like bodybuilders literally will do 60 minutes of stair stepping if they're like training for a competition. But then if you're like, Hey, I did a 60 minute run. They're like, that's ludicrous. All of your gains are going to be killed. I'm like the cardio volume of a, like a, a bodybuilder is probably no different than someone training for a 10 K. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like your body's like, Oh, well, 
well, they're a bodybuilder. So we're going to pull from less muscle. You know what I mean? Like this, it's like, no, it's no different. That 30 minutes of stair stepping I do when I'm training for an ultra is no different than the Fitzbo who's doing 30 minutes of stair stepping at the end of her workout and telling you it's for booty gains. And then like one touting it as supporting your gains and one saying like, that is the worst thing that you could ever do for yourself. And so with that, like, I will wrap that up. Like the interference is so much less than what you think at the volume you're kind of be doing for most fitness goals. Like we're talking probably getting into like, unless you're doing events that are two, three, four, five hours in duration, you, you could even probably get to like the half marathon distance. It's when you have like specific, really uh, like high end goals within running where you're going to have to start making some compromise, but like, there's probably no reason. I mean, think about how many really fit dudes, you know, that can probably run a 10 K and like, 45 to 55 minutes. And that's pretty good, right? Like that's pretty good. And like they're muscular and they're fit and like, they're still able to keep up with everything else they're doing. You just have to give yourself time to adapt to that. And then like, make sure that you're fueling it in the process. Yeah. I want to be respectful of your time. I'm gonna do a little summary. You tell me if you got to go, we'll wrap things up, but I think it is I have important. Time. You're, you're okay. You want to spill over. I have cool. time. You're okay. I think it's important just to recap that. I think there's so the question comes up of like how much is too much? At what point is there this interference effect? And I think a couple of things that you hit super well was the importance of fueling. Uh, and you're going to run into these objective measures of like overreaching or overtraining or some amount of interference that's al not allowing you to progress in, let's say, your hypertrophy or your strength programs. You're going to run into those objective measures a lot quicker if you're not fueling. I mean, this is like should be common sense that you're adding in a lot of activity. And that's probably going to also mean that you're going to need to add in a coinciding amount of calories. Uh, I'd love to talk about the carbs a little bit more in a second, but I do think that important, re uh, just a reminder of like, you said bar speed. That's awesome. I think that that's a really, really good one. Most people here are not going to be, uh, are going to be a little bit more in the hypertrophy realm. So I still think yeah. that if we stick in that it, it, objectively, if you're unable to make the sorts of progressions that you were making or intuitively, you know, you could make, or your coach is prescribing you to make, it's like once your performance, it's so funny because in the world of hypertrophy, there's like a, and I'll say it myself, I don't actually care about the pounds that I lift, but I need to because the one of the best, if not the best proxy for muscle growth that we have is strength. And so for somebody out there who doesn't actually care about the weights that they're lifting or the reps that they're getting, like if you're worried about whether or not this is interfering or not, like the importance of, it just comes back to the importance of tracking what you're doing so that you know, okay, you know, you have a finite amount of like recovery and adaptive mechanisms. And if you're doing, you know, like the fishbowl example, like the, the minute you know that fishbowl fish is empty is when you're not making positive adaptations anymore. And so bar speed is a great one. And if you, if you guys are out there and if you have that, if you can film it and there's apps that do this, and I'm sure you have yeah. good, good options for that. That's a really good one. Very objective. But even just, what if, what did you get last week on certain lifts? What are you doing this week on certain lifts? How's that trending I mean, over what's time? what's your RPE at the same way? Yeah, way? absolutely. Time after time, right? Totally. Like obviously week to week, there's variability. There's but like that's the factors. best thing is to ask sure. yourself is like, cause I can tell when I'm at the peak of training for a race, I'll move a weight and I'll look at my coach and I'll be like, holy shit, that is a nine. And that yeah. should be a six. Sure, you know what I mean? totally. Yeah, like you get to that point where like, and that, I mean, with, I mean, I ran like my first hypertrophy cycle in years this past fall. And it was not fun. I don't want to do that again, <laughs> um, but like, that's exactly it. Just tracking yourself. And if you get into those situations where like, and I don't want people to be like, oh my God, I need to abandon ship. I'm not making gains reassess. Like, do you need to do that maintenance with your cardio for a little bit where you just keep it or decrease it by five or 10% and maintain there until you sure. can adapt or like, mm -hmm. isn't it eating, sleeping, stress thing? Like you can't just be like, well, running fucking ruined all my gains. I'm never going to do it again. Right. Yeah. No, you just have to let yourself adapt to it or actually like. Take Your fishbowl was already half empty because you recover like shit. You don't eat enough, enough carbs, yeah. you don't sleep. And so I definitely yeah. agree with a lot of that. I love that there's a, there's a little bit of like, when we're looking at like just body composition adaptations, gaining, losing weight, you know, getting leaner, whatever, like the carbon, carbon fat ratio is of minute importance. Should calories and protein be equated, but in this context, it is not. And I have seen so many times where this like running made me gain weight because running made me hungry. And yeah. I listen, being hungry leading to gaining weight, isn't a big, crazy leap. Like we understand how that happens. And so if you are increasing the amount of cardio that you're doing specifically higher intensity, um, I definitely think that this would be an element of, I'm a big count calories and protein first advocate, at least generally speaking. Yes. But if you have this sort of hybrid approach, you have cardiovascular approach, you have something that's a little bit more glycolytic. Like we all think like, I always laugh about this where like hypertrophy gets this, listen, higher carb approaches are probably net net better than really, really low carb approaches for hypertrophy. But the, like, it's just not as important. You're not depleting all your muscle glycogen in a fucking 45 minute hypertrophy session, but adding no. in 10 to 20 miles a week when you're somebody who has never 
isn't currently doing that sort of thing, that actually might start to tax that. And you actually might start to want to focus and or a little bit lean heavier on, on carbohydrates. And so that's definitely something that I've seen for sure. Um, yeah. And and the last point that I wrote down was just like that recognizing that the more intense the cardio, the more overlap with the lifting. And so the more intense the cardio, the more similar it is physiologically to the hypertrophy or strength that you're doing. And so that's not to say that you can't do speed training, but there's just one piece of data that we have to look at when we're building a program. It's like, okay, we can't be like, okay, I'm only going to do five days of, of walk, run or interval or sprinting or, and my training, like those two things that have more overlap of this, like, you know, proverbial Venn diagram than going for a longer, slower run. Like you use zones, like a zone two run or something like that yeah. will have a little bit less interference. And that's the thing is like, even with that though, like my programs and a lot of programs, like you, you you don't even want the bulk of your endurance training to be high intensity. You really want like 20 ish percent of it will be zone three, three, four, five ish. So like you just need kind of one day a week of that higher intensity and it doesn't have to be that high of volume either. And so like, that's where like, I think people get caught up. They start doing like, they run all their easy runs really hard, or they start adding all the speed work. And then they just feel like trash. And I'm like, you could just do a couple easy runs and like one 15 to 20 minute hard session one day a week on a day that it's not like it's far enough away from your next big lift. And if you do it frequently enough, you'll recover from doing the same thing more often. And then you won't even notice it at all anymore. And so it's like keeping that dosage to an appropriate place. I think people forget, like, even if you are adding the intensity, which is more fatiguing and more similar to your lifting is like, well, just put it in a smart place. And then it probably won't, you won't even notice it after like enough time of doing it. Yeah. If you're looking in, and I want you to, you're going to rephrase what I'm saying in a better way. So yes. if you're, if you're somebody out there who I know, listen, I have a hypertrophy, hypertrophy group with hundreds of people in it. I coach people primarily in terms of exercise modality for hypertrophy. If you are listening to this and you do primarily hypertrophy, but you want to start incorporating some running, a couple of key takeaways from today would be start slow. You're, you're, you're a pretty no, These are novel stimuli. You don't need to do a lot to get a lot of uh, adaptation from this. So you don't need to be worried about the interference effect at this point because you don't need to be doing a lot of volume to get these adaptations. So start slow. I don't mean necessarily running slow. You'll touch a little bit more on that, but start slow in terms of adding volume. Um, uh, maybe do your lifts or whatever you care about first. Uh, if you can separate them by more than six hours, do that. If you can do them on different days, maybe do that. Um, again, if you can't, then re resort to kind of doing what you want to do or what you care about doing first. If you're finding that you're adding in cardio, at least understand that you should be adding in calories as well. And if you can make those calories primarily come from carbohydrates, it's probably going to have the best bang for your buck. Um, what did I miss here? I feel like I don't know if I have the brain capacity. To <laughs> that. I'm not the best for that. Uh, um, um, there was something I was going to add to that though. And then I totally blinked what you asked. That's cool. Oh um, man. Oh, I did want to add this. The little bit of data we do have on this stuff though shows like to help you if you all are worried about hypertrophy, endurance will probably affect strength more than it's going to affect the hypertrophy because of that high end neuromuscular recruitment that it slows down. So for the most part, I mean, your strength of what the weight you're moving might be impacted, but your muscle probably won't be as impacted as like my like one rep maxes that I care more about are going to sure. be impacted by right. this. So, you know, keeping that in mind, I think though, like the volume that hypertrophy dictates though, is where it gets hard with running and training. Cause like, especially if like I'm running for training for a race, I'm only, and this is what I do with clients. This is what I suggest. I do like a lot of strength cycles when you're doing race training, you're in one to five rep range. You're not doing a ton Low of volume, volume. that decreases yeah. the volume, even though the intensity is high, the volume is lower. So keeping in mind though, like depending on the volume of what you are doing with your hypertrophy, um, you know, that's a lot like hypertrophy is a lot of volume. It sucks. I will not be doing another hypertrophy phase anytime soon. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not anti-hypertrophy. I do, I do enough hypertrophy, but like I did like my first true one and I was like, no, thank you. Uh -huh. Um, but with that being said, yeah, like it, it, it does appear to hurt that a little bit less. So, so I just think that people like the thing that stops them the most is like this just internal panic before nothing has changed. Like, just this, this internal narrative they have that these things are going to hurt them or they're not going to work for them. And then like, they haven't even done it long enough. And like, I think the biggest advice I can give people is like, 
you can always gain back strength and you can always gain back muscle, or you can always train back, gain back aerobic training. Like if you lose any of those, like, it's not like, and you're like, Oh, it's so hard. I works, but like, it comes back faster and easier the next time around. Like I lose muscle every time I train for a race and I don't freak out. Cause you know what happens as soon as I start lifting again, Oh my God, all my muscle comes back. Like the worst case scenario is not as bad as you think it is. I know unless you're like, but if you're in a, so if you're so elite in your hypertrophy and training, then like this podcast isn't for you. Like, like I just like, that's the, like my raw, I feel like with hybrid or concurrent training, sometimes I have to be really honest with people where I'm like, you're don't need to worry about that. Like it's, it's like, it's not, it's not even an issue for you at this moment. Nine out of 10 times the conversation that I'm having with people is this person who's doing hypertrophy, who wants to do some running is nervous about it, killing their gains. And so I think that's just like, if you're taking something from this, listen, if you're doing four days a week hypertrophy, which a lot of the people listen to this podcast are, you can, you can incorporate a couple, two to three days, let's say two to three sessions. There's more and less logical ways of incorporating them, but you can do some running as long as you're fueling, paying attention to biofeedback and objective measures of performance. You won't get into this place where you're killing your gains or you're overtraining or, you know, you'll catch a lot of that before it happens. If you're, if you're fueling enough and you're paying attention to biofeedback and objective measures. Yeah. Or spend awesome. some time just building up your aerobic capacity and maintaining your muscle and then try to build them together. Like if that's like, you don't have the time to do both to the capacity of what you want to do, like maintaining things is always an option. And I think people forget that. It's also easier. It's all, every new study that comes out decreases the threshold for maintenance of, of all these adaptations. It's crazy. I know. And that's what I try to explain to people too. With like, if you do decide that you ever want to do a bigger race, the amount of lifting you have to do to maintain your strength and so hypertrophy little, while yeah. brace training is like so much more less than you think it is. It's more about like supporting your, what you're doing to being like a little bit more like bipedal and like, you know, single leg work and supporting like the muscles and like tendons and ligaments that you're using with running with a repetitive force. But like you can maintain so much with so little, right? Like, especially like once you get into this training for races, like if that's something that you do decide to do, if you're like, okay, well, like, well, maybe I do want to run a half marathon or maybe I do want to run a marathon or, you know, this, this crazy girl inspired me to run an ultra. Like you're not going to like wither away. I think people like can, they chronically look at the front of runners racing packs. And like, if you want to be elite at something, yeah, you're probably not going to be built like a giant bodybuilder. Like, of course you're not going to be right. But that's like, that's a conversation for another day. If you ever got that gung ho about it, but that like is not most people running those races. There are most people are not like that's not their phenotype. Like, so I think people like tend to think, well, that's immediately what I'm going to look like. And I'm like, no, you probably look like maybe yourself, but 2% less muscle after a year of endurance training. Like you're not going to lose it that we saw that with COVID, right. When everyone got locked down, they're like, oh my God, I'm going to wither away to nothing. And all I did was handstand pushups on my front porch for two months. And I could still overhead press like 90% of the weight I was in the gym the week before. Like, you know what I mean? You're like, you don't, you need so little to maintain these things. So yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is just like people get, especially hypertrophy, bodybuilding cultures, like this idea that like, you know, everything's going to kill your gains, but like the interference is just, it's not happening to the extent of what you think it is. It's not happening as early as you think it is. And that's probably more due to a volume recovery thing at the point of what you're at than anything else. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Let's end it there. Why don't you tell people where they can find you, plug some products, whatever you want to do. You guys should absolutely follow us. Uh, she has like the, some of the best, obviously this on this topic and other topics. So sh- give us a shout, tell people where they can find you. Yeah. So you can follow me at littlest fitness. I don't know when this is releasing though. When is this releasing? Next week. Okay. I was going to say, we're changing my handle when I defend, but I know some people pre-record podcasts. So yeah, right now I'm still littlest fitness. Um, not for long. Um, so littlest fitness on Instagram, my website is littlestfitness.com. I hang out on Instagram the most. Um, I did start my YouTube recently and I have my podcast called the messy middle podcast. So you'll be able to find like more stuff on that. I'm going to start kind of documenting more of my training. And, um, I have some podcast episodes that talk about, you know, various topics of like my whole niche, if you're interested in that, but, um, over on Instagram is where I mostly hang out. But if you are interested in this kind of stuff, I think that like the most useful resource is like, well, one, I have an ebook called endure that explains the science of running and I sell running programs. Now they're in my app. Um, and you could do a 5k beginner program. I have 10k beginner programs that are like no speed work. If you're worried about that, then I have intermediate ones that do have speed work appropriately dosed, periodized, all that stuff. Um, but my ebook hybrid is the one that I released last year after wild demands is like, 
essentially it's the book that explains more in depth, the science of concurrent training, like what it is, what that looks like. I have like my whole description of like capacity and what you can do and like fitness status and training status. And like, I have a whole section on nutrition and recovery in there because that's really important with these kinds of things. And then I have like seasons and examples of how to set up your year of training based off the goals you have. Like sometimes it's like, if you're a CrossFitter who wants to add in running because you want to get better at wads versus like, I want to train for an ultra well maintaining strength versus like whoever you are, like all these different, I have these like little examples in there. Um, but then you get this, uh, this giant table that shows you basically like, Hey, if you are like a beginner or an intermediate or advanced or whatever, and you are lifting two, three or four days a week, and you are running two, three or four days, five days a week, whatever it is. And you're training three, four, five, or six days a week. Here's how to set up your week of training. Like I have like, it's like over 60 examples that shows you how to do that. Cause I think that's what people get the most hung up on is how to set up their week. And I have examples for people who like, if you go train more on the weekends because you're a weekend warrior and you have a busy work week versus you train more on the weekdays, like setting it up to structure for you. So I do have a few different resources across the board on that. What hybrid and endure are just really, really good science heavy eBooks. If you just want to learn about this stuff and be more intelligent about it, they both include factors of nutrition and the science and the training and the application. And then my running programs, which I did just re-release in my app, which are great. And I think I've had like, I've hoped over like I don't know, 1600 people like who didn't believe that could be runners or run and lift at the same time, like cross their first race all the way from 5k to the 50k ultra marathon distance. So, um, I truly believe like, you know, based off what my clients are experiencing, like you can do that and have your gains and like, still be like super shocked. Um, and if anything, I feel like you're like going to look back in a year from now and be like, holy crap. Like I used to really hold myself back from doing this one thing that brings me a lot of joy and it ended up being just okay. So those are the eBooks and products that I would most recommend if you're interested in learning this. And then, um, yeah, I have my Instagram and all of my education there is organized in guides based off topics. You can go through all my posts and read more about this. I have one all on lifting and running together, but a lot of that still applies to other forms of fitness. If like you're interested in cycling or, you know, doing your training and including it with like your Peloton classes or anything like that, like similar rules apply. So keep that in mind. So anyway, that's my shameless plug of what I recommend. Um, I do also have, if you go to my website or my Instagram, I have a free 5k prep plan. So if you have like never ran before in your life and you want to get started and you want like five weeks of kind of like easing into it and, and, and like that, I mean, it's completely free and you can sign up for that. Um, and that would maybe help you kind of ease into it in a more realistic walk runway so that like, it doesn't feel like too much right off the bat. Love that. Amazing. Awesome. I hope everyone goes and checks that out. If you want any of that stuff, I'll plug a lot of that stuff in the description. So thanks for coming on, Alyssa. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Jordan.